This project was made possible with support from California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Visit calhume.org. From KVPR in Fresno. On this week's The Other California, our reporters tell the stories of how their families came to the San Joaquin Valley, the struggles they faced getting here, and what they found when they arrived. So there's poverty, and then there's racism layered on top of it. My dad talked about being in high school and taking a college prep course, and the counselor saying, you know, you're wasting a seed that could go to a student who's actually going to go to college. And they share the stories of those temporarily left behind. She talks a lot about running to the border and trying to, like, cross the border um, to get to her family, and the Border Patrol would always be like, go home, little girl, like, it's not going to happen. It's all about how people get to the other California and the lives they create here, sometimes out of almost nothing. I'm Alice Daniel, and this is... El otro California. I live California, right California. 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 Chia. Yes. El otro California. Yeah. The other California. California. Is California. The other California. Is California. California. Is California. We listen to other Californians. I live, I live, I live the in the other California. California. In the first episode of The Other California, I told you about why and how I came to the San Joaquin Valley, specifically Fresno. A lot of people related to it and brought up their own histories and how they got here. Our news team is emblematic of so many of those histories. Plus, as you'll see, they're great storytellers. So get comfortable, sit back, and take a listen. Here's Sarith Hawk, Madi Balanos, Kathleen Schock, and Carrie Klein. So I'll start. My name is Sarith Hawk. I'm a reporter here at KVPR. And we have a pretty long story. My family is Cambodian. Um, everybody was from Cambodia originally. And like a lot of Cambodians that I knew, we were part of the unfortunate genocide that happened from 1975 to 1979. Now, I wasn't, but my parents were, my grandparents, all my aunts and uncles um, and miraculously, most of us all survived and uh, were able to escape to a refugee camp in Thailand. And that's where I was born. So um, we actually got help, uh, refugees, status, came over to the U.S. My dad's family came to the U.S. My mom's family went to Canada. Um, so our side of the family we all landed in Los Angeles uh, back in 1986, and we were part of a pretty big wave of, of Cambodian refugees during that time who had all survived the genocide. Um, so, yeah, we stayed in the Southern California area for a long time. And another thing that's part of the Cambodian-American story is that um, a lot of us have gone into the donut business because there was, uh, back in that time, a man who had uh, escaped the war. He came to the U.S. and started opening donut shops because that's what he knew. And he uh, helped a lot of other Cambodian refugees who came, you know, and trained them to open their own stores. And so my family kind of found a, a niche in that. It wasn't... Um, directly through him, but my dad, uh, you know, he learned how to start baking. Um, that was basically his first job in the U.S. was he was he was a, a baker. And then um, he and my mom saved up money and borrowed money and um, they opened up their first their first shop and they've kind of been moving around California ever since. And I landed in Fresno kind of around my high school year, which is kind of a weird time to move for a kid. But yeah, we, we came to Fresno. Um, I was a teenager and it was like a big culture shock to me uh, because I had kind of moved around different parts of California where it wasn't as diverse. You had um, been in Tehachapi for a little while, right? Yes, I was in Tehachapi. I was in like the Santa Clarita era, area. And yeah, coming to Fresno, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, 
here is like literally a different person like everywhere that I look and I just totally felt at home coming back here. Yeah. And and so I, I stayed basically through uh, high school and college, went to Fresno State, started my journalism career here in Fresno. Yeah. And then uh, left for a long time, <laughs> a long time, but came back, came back uh, about a year ago um, to help my family out. And it's been it's been wonderful ever since. Can I ask uh, a quick question? Yeah. What, what exactly brought your family to Fresno? Mm-hmm. So my folks... They just wanted a kind of a fresh start. Um, We actually already had family in Fresno. So it was easy for them to move here to um, run a business uh, because they had the support of family. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, we were kind of always out by ourselves around Southern California. So coming back to Fresno was like coming back to family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Well, I'm Madi Bolaños, and I'm the immigration and underserved uh, communities reporter here at KVPR. Um, and similar to Sarith, my family came from another country. They came from Mexico. Um, and it makes me emotional to talk about it because, as you all know, I think very highly of my grandpa who passed away um, in 2020. <sighs> and I feel like he's like the start of our family in a way. Um, but they... Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. We're here with you, Maddie. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we need tissues in here. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, right? But um, so my parents actually met in Fresno. So they have two different stories of how they came um, to the Central Valley. And um, my mom and her family um, lived in Sinaloa, which is a state in Mexico for a while. And then they moved closer to the border to Mexicali. And ultimately what brought them to the Central Valley is they were trying to escape poverty I mean, they lived, they're a family of seven, um, and they just were barely making ends meet. And my grandpa really wanted his lineage to have more than what he had. Um, And he always saw the United States as a way to do that. Um, And kind of like most people who migrate to the United States, you know, you know someone in a certain area and they let you know that it's a good area and there's good work. And so... He actually came first with my grandma and three of their kids. And so my mom stayed um, on her own with her oldest sister. Um, And then a few years later, they made uh, the move from that town to Madera, California. Um, And my grandma still lives there now. And so does most of my family. And my father, he's from Guadalajara, Jalisco, which is uh, a little bit more southern Mexico. Um, And he had a little bit of a different upbringing, actually. His parents were both teachers, so they had like more middle class lifestyle. Um, But there were also other issues at home. And I think he was just excited by the idea of the United States. He also had some family members that had moved to Fresno. And one of his aunts really encouraged him, well, basically told him, like, if you save up enough money, like, I can help you figure out how to make the move to Fresno. So they met during, actually, they met because they were both models for, like, quinceanera dresses. And what? Outfits. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, I was so proud of that growing up. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we, my mom grew up in Madeira, um, and then she had me, um, but she also didn't want me to live in Madeira. She felt like there was a lot of gang violence and just they weren't immediately welcomed there. Um, And even she talked about recently, you know, a lot of like Mexicans who were born in Madeira, like called them wetbacks and just treated them really poorly because they saw themselves as better than like the people, the Mexicans that came from Mexico and were born in Mexico. So when I was about five years old, we moved to Fresno. And like Sreeth says, I I loved it. I felt like it was super diverse. I mean, I went to Edison High School, and that's a very diverse area. And I just felt like I knew a little bit about so many cultures. Um, and then I left for college, and I went to San Francisco State. And I felt the same. I was like, this is awesome. Like, I'm not getting a culture shock because, you know, I went from diverse area to diverse area. Um, And I enjoyed my time there. I went to D.C. to do an internship. And that was where I got my (laughs) culture shock. Um, And I also really realized that I wasn't really interested in doing national politics. Um, 
like I've mentioned, I come from mixed status family and I felt like it was really important for me to do work that represented and uplifted the voices from my community. So I decided to make my way back to Fresno and I've been here for two years now. Um, and what keeps me here really is my family. You know, I think about maybe sometimes leaving again and I'm like, who's going to hang out with my grandma or take my cousins where they need to go? And so that's something I really enjoy about the Central Valley is that it always feels like home to me. So that's really interesting, Wadi. Um, so what was it like for your for your mother when she was you know left behind in, in Mexico with the rest of her family up here? Yeah, I think from what she tells me, it was traumatic. Um I want to be careful. I don't want to put her business out too much. Um, But I think to this day, she still holds some resentment towards my grandma, um, which is interesting because it was my grandpa's idea to go. And my grandma just felt like she needed to go with him. And at the time, my grandma, she says that my mom had a fever. So she didn't want to. And she was seven. So she didn't want to want to put her through like the whole traveling process because it wasn't easy obviously it wasn't done legally so there was a lot of hiding and just yeah it just wasn't a safe travel for some a kid who was sick so she was left behind with my tia Ceci, which is the oldest of the five and I think my tia Ceci was 11 so she was 11 taking care of like seven six wow. years old Um, And they were also left with, like, family friends who weren't the nicest and maybe took advantage of the situation a little bit more. So my mom, aw, my mom talks a lot about, um, oh, my God, I'm going to cry. Sorry. (laughs) She talks a lot about running to the border and trying to, like, cross the border um, to get to her family. And the Border Patrol would always be like go home, little girl, like, it's not going to happen, so. Wow, amazing. Yeah, it was sad. And then when they finally did travel to meet with our family, she, um, or my aunt, they tried to physically hurt her. Um, And it's really crazy because that happened, and my aunt obviously fought this man off. Um, And then, like, these men, like, barged in and were kind of like, do you know whose daughter this is? Like, this is Tomas Reyes's daughter. Like, you do not touch her. And, yeah, I think for a very long time, my mom and my tia were bonded over, like, that traumatic part in their life. Um, Wow. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, of course. Beautiful. All right, I guess I'll go next. (laughs) Um, So my name's Kathleen Schock. I am also, uh, you know, with KVPR, obviously. And, um, my parents, my, my dad is black and my mom's white. And so their family's journeys to the Valley were kind of different. Um, so my dad was born in St. Louis and, um, my grandma worked in a factory there. They were pretty poor and they decided to come to the Central Valley because they had a relative who owned property in Calwa, which was kind of unusual, you know, for Blacks at that time, this is the 1940s, uh, to own property. It it was my, I guess, my great-grandfather, and I guess he was really mean. So they came out, my dad was one of seven kids, and so they took the train out, they get to my great-grandfather's house, and he was like, okay, you could stay on the property, but you can't live in the house. Like, wouldn't let them come in the house. So they lived in a tent um, Mm. all through my dad's school. They started, well, I guess in high school, my grandmother um, secured like a storage shed that somebody was getting rid of and so they moved that to the property and that's where my dad lived all through high school wow yeah crazy and they worked in the fields um you know but my all my my dad my aunts and uncles were really really good students and so they all did really well and my grandmother was amazing and um so yeah they went on to become doctors and lawyers and had a totally different life for me you know lined up because of the educational opportunities that they had here. On my mom's side, my great-grandfather, no, my grandfather, so my mom's mom, my mom's dad. Sorry, I'm nervous. I don't know why. It's it's just uncomfortable talking about this stuff. I don't know. Um, Anyway, my grandfather on my mom's side was part of the uh, wave of uh, 
German farmers who were farming along the Volga River in Russia who migrated here um, because they were, you know, basically recruited to come here and start family farms. Um, so it's kind of crazy when I was doing the reporting on fair mead, you know, that's all the people that made fair mead possible. I mean, those are the exact stories of both sides of my family. Wow. Um, it was really, um, really moving to feel connected to the valley um, in those through those two stories. So anyway, that's how we got here. So my dad and all of his siblings, they all worked in the fields um, their whole lives, basically. My dad um, actually growing up, now I'm emotional. Yeah. <laughs> so growing up, my dad had this um, iron, this iron, like it was rusty. It was, and one of those old irons that you heat up over a fire uh, on our mantle. And one day I asked him like, well, you know, what's the story with the iron? And he's like, well, that's the iron that we use to iron clothes, you know, when I was a kid. And he explained to me that when he was seven, um, he would stay home and take care of the younger kids and do the laundry while the older kids and my grandparents worked in the fields. And then when he got a little bit older, then he would go out in the fields, like probably around the age of 10. So like at seven wow. years old, he was, you know, raising kids alone and ironing over an open flame. And <laughs> um, yeah, it's just pretty amazing. Isn't it crazy that like we come from people who had to do that? Like, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Um, and when I think about it, it's, I'm just so, I'm so proud of them, mm -hmm. you know, and so grateful. Proud and grateful. And also like, I don't know, like the kid in me hurts for like the kid in them in the sense that that had to happen and they couldn't live like a kid life. Yeah. Oh, completely, completely. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then you layer on. So there's poverty, mm -hmm. and then there's racism layered on top of it. Mm -hmm. You know, like my dad talked about being in high school and taking a college prep course, and the counselor saying, "You know, you're wasting a seat that could go to a student who's actually going to go to college." Wow. Mm -hmm. um, it's just um, to be that close. And that was here. That was here. Yeah. You know, and 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 to think that. You know, I was born in 1976. I think interracial marriage had only been legal in this country for like maybe 10 years at that point. Wow. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's touching. Did I miss how your parents met? <laughs> <laughs> so my dad was a doctor. My mom was a nurse. They met in a bar. Um, nice. yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. My mom, every time she'd pull out her cigarette, my dad would turn around and like with the lighter ready to go. Like, he's a total <laughs> ladies man. Um, yeah, that's how they met. Nice. Yeah. That's sweet. Carrie, what's your story? Yeah. I have a very different story from all of yours. Um, my story is a lot more like Alice's, uh, where, you know, I didn't grow up here. I'm from the East coast. I grew up in the Boston area and spent most of my life on the East coast, and uh, it was only after I met my my now husband. Um, we we met in we were living in D.C. for a few years before we came here, and he got a job at Fresno State um, teaching. And so that's how we came here. We moved directly from D.C. And you know we we didn't really know much about the place. We we had we had toured the area and seen the university when we came here, and it was a good job. And you know we we we've, we've done we've done a fair amount of traveling, and so we were like, it's just you know it's any other place. Well. We'll make it work. And um, a lot of people had really talked this place down. Like we had a lot of friends from the Bay Area specifically who were just like, oh, Fresno. You, you sure you want to go there? And then even we actually had a friend who who was from Fresno and who could not wait to escape. And even she had said, you guys are going to hate it. Wow. <laughs> and, and so we were worried. We were nervous. Um, but, uh, you know, I think almost setting us up with really low expectations maybe actually helped because then we got here really not knowing what to expect. And very quickly, people from the university had reached out to my husband to welcome him. They connected us with friends, many of whom were here in the neighborhood where we lived. And so, you know, before we knew it, we were being invited to parties and getting like, you know, folded into friend groups and then getting introduced to you know, cool events happening around town. And we were just really utterly, I mean, I think he came out here first. He was out here six months and then I moved out after that. And I think 
um, my first weekend that I was here, I got invited to like three parties. And so we were just really utterly charmed by how warm and welcoming everyone was here. And, um, you know, and then, of course, the the location here is also really a bonus. We love how close we are to the mountains and we can get to the coast and the fresh produce is amazing. Like these, mm-hmm. the peaches here were a revelation compared to where we had been. So it really didn't take us long at all to to um, to really feel at home here and then to also start defending this place to other people <laughs> when, they would, when they would talk it down later. So I got to say, I really relate to your friend who grew up here and was like, you're going to hate it. Um, yep. That was me for so many because I left Fresno. I was gone for like a decade and never thought I would move back. Like I I left <laughs> as soon as I turned 18 and was like, you know, to heck with Fresno. Um, yeah. And, and so coming back was I had to eat a lot of crow. Like I'm like, actually, it's not so bad here after all. Well, so what brought you back? A job, actually. And it was so funny. I was having lunch with my mom and my phone rang and it was uh, Channel 47 offering me a job. I was a TV reporter at the time. And uh, so and I had better offers. So like, I took the call, but I'm like, I'm not going to take I'm not going to come back to Fresno. <laughs> so anyway, I hung up and I said, oh, mom, that's so weird. I just got a job offer, you know, here in town. And my mom immediately started crying. Aww. I was like, I never thought you'd move back. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, I'm not going to. It's easier to take the job, like the the conversation with my mom. So, yeah, I moved back thinking I would just, I signed like a two-year contract, and I'm like, I'll serve my time, hang out with my dad, and then I'm out. And then my family tricked me, and they gave me the money for a down payment on a house that I'm still (laughs) living in. So, but I'm I'm really happy that I was tricked. Um, Yeah, I like it here. I was going to say the same. I definitely felt like your friend and you, Kathleen. Um, I remember I was in high school and this substitute was saying how she had just moved from somewhere. And I was like, why? (laughs) Why'd you come to Fresno? Like, ew. And she was like, well, you know, it's like not far from the bay or the mountain. I was like, okay, I guess. (laughs) Like, um, But again, I left and then kind of was like, you know, I realized like there's a lot in Fresno. And I also think that like Fresno is more fun as an adult than it is as a kid. Mm, yeah. I yeah. agree. Right? Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just more to do, more events. Like, yeah. I don't know. As a kid, you're really limited, in yeah. my opinion. And I will say the older you get, the better Fresno gets. Because, yeah. I mean, really, at the end of the day, I do the same stuff that my friends in L.A. do because we're all just boring, right? We <laughs> like, watch TV and go out to dinner once a week maybe. And and, and we don't have to fight, you know, traffic and all the, exactly. you know, high. Mm-hmm. Now, Sarith, you were, you boomeranged too. Yes, was- yes. I was also, I couldn't wait to leave Fresno. I mm-hmm. left, um kind of in the middle of my TV career. I was in you know TV news too for a long time and I moved to Sacramento. I thought, oh, I'm going to just stay in Sacramento for a few years and then um, go off to the next market. And I ended up staying there for 10 years. So I was oh. gone for a decade as well. And then um, came back to Fresno. Didn't know what to expect because I hadn't been back in I really hadn't hung out in Fresno in a good 10 years. And um, I I feel the same way I relate to everything that you guys are saying. I love it now. I love it here. Um, You know, I was able to come back and just reconnect with good friends. And that's really at the end of the day what it's about. It's, It's the people that you're surrounded with, you know. And coming back to how you started the conversation, the diversity of this community is such an asset. Like growing yes. up, you know, my dad's friends were, you know, Japanese and, you know, we, we would make, you know, sushi with the tonais and then we'd make tamales with the, you know, you know, another f- family friends of ours. And, and, you know, you'd show up at the front doorstep, you know, after a long day and there'd be like a basket of produce that somebody had just left because they had too many oranges or too many lemons. And, yeah. you know, all that stuff I took for granted as a kid. Mm-hmm. And coming back, I realized, what a treasure that is. Um, and I think also uh, on the subject of, of the uh, the people here, one thing that's been really inspiring for me as an outsider is to see how much people here in the, in the whole valley as a whole, how how driven they are to improve their communities. You know, I think where we came from in yeah. Washington, D.C., there's also a ton of that because there are there's either segregation, there's lots of disparities and, and there are lots of problems there as well. But a lot of the people that I knew in D.C., they wanted to uh, they wanted to change the world like they they worked in politics they worked on the hill they worked for nonprofits and think tanks etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's all really cool but then we moved here and people really want to change their community mm. 
and I've, I've and I've found that really really inspiring to to be here and to to learn about all of that work. I think it's interesting because I think that's like a newer phenomenon. Or like we all said, like we are like we need to get out of here, and now we're like okay, let's get back and make this a better place, you mm. know. So thank you guys. Yeah, yeah. This is I, yeah. I learned so much about you all. This is really <laughs> cool. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the other California. Next week, we go to the small rural town of Huron on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, where a beauty salon stays open late to meet farm workers' hours, and the town fights to have its own high school. Right now, kids take a bus to another town 20 miles away. This episode was produced by me, Alice Daniel, mixing and sound design by Rob Spate, with editorial help from Polly Stryker, web support from Alex Burke, technical support from Don Weaver. Joe Moore is our president and general manager. Special thanks to the KVPR news team, Madi Bolaños, Sarith Hawk, Carrie Klein, and Kathleen Schock, and musicians Omar Nare, Juan Morales, and Jim Karagosian. You've been listening to The Other California.